Today, we're going to be looking at the rest of chapter 2, and um, we're going to look at how Jesus is greater even in his humanity. Hopefully this will become more clear to you as we work our way through the text, but, but uh, now the writer of Hebrews, just to remind you guys, he, he's writing to show all those Jews who put their faith in the Old Testament that Jesus... And he's trying to show them that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And, uh, you know, and so he's trying to get them not to go back to the old way when there's a new, completed way and, uh, in, in Christ. And so, you know, without Jesus and the New Testament, the Old Testament's unfulfilled. And it really, really doesn't even make sense. Because everything in the Old Testament points to the coming of the Messiah. He revealed himself in Jesus Christ. And so we talked about how, you know, we saw how the Jews put a lot of emphasis on angels and their power and, and their influence. And uh, these New Testament Jews, uh, you know, many of them probably had witnessed the life of Christ. And, uh, you know, or their parents had witnessed the life of Christ at this point. And, of course, they knew that Jesus was a man. And so in their minds, you know, Jesus is a man and angels are greater than men. So, you know, what makes Jesus so special? And so, this is why in the, the last part of the last chapter, the writer, you know, helps us to see that Jesus is greater than angels. And, and he gives us all those reasons why. And um, he warned us not to forget all that, lest we drift away and, um, you know, drift away from the truth. You know, even today, there are people who refuse to accept Jesus as God. I mean, we know that. And, and a lot of times it may be because they understand that He was a man. And not many people today uh, who give it a realistic look deny the existence of Jesus. He was obviously a man who lived on, in this world and uh, more has been written about Him and His life than anyone else. And, and uh, there's more evidence there. So um, but most people don't argue that. But a lot of times they just don't believe that Jesus was God. They believe He was just a man. We've talked about that before. And they think, well, how, how could Jesus be God? You know, because they know man struggles. You know, they, they know the struggles of humanity. And, and uh, so, but let me assure you, you know, there's something that's true that I think the Bible makes clear. That is the fact that Jesus was a man. But he was not just a man. He is the unique, one-of-a-kind God-man. Fully God yet fully human. And so today, what I want you to understand with the writer of Hebrews is that even though Jesus was flesh and blood on this earth a man, he's still greater than everything. Just because he was a man doesn't make him less than what he has always been as God. And so I think that's the point that the writer of Hebrews is really trying to get across you know, to us. And, and you know, he's still greater than everything. Even though he became a man, so even in his humanity, when at, at, you can say in a sense, I guess God's weakest point, He was still greater than everything. And that's what we want to understand today. Jesus is greater. And uh, He's greater than all your troubles. He's greater than all your sin. And in Him, you will find everything you need. And, and I think that's what the Bible tries to tell us. So let's read the text together. We're going to read Hebrews chapter 2. Beginning at verse 5. And we're going to read all the way down through verse 18. So uh, we're going to read the Word of God. Let's just follow along with me, or try to as we read. I'll be reading from the ESV, which will be on the screen. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels, you have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for 
whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell you of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. And deliver all those who through who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it's not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people, because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is the word of God. Let's, let's pray for a moment. Father, thank you so much <clears throat> for sending Jesus, who lived as we live, and the Lord understands all of our plot, but yet lived perfectly without sin died in our place for our sins, easing your wrath and, and um, rec making a way for us to be reconciled. So Father, today, make that clear. Help us to understand the truth of this scripture and who you are and um, change our hearts and lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The last place I worked before I, I took my present job, we had a couple of different build outs where we had expansions of the building or re rebuilding everything and the nature of my job <clears throat> I had to oversee some construction crews and stuff and, and uh, <clears throat> during, the, during the first one and we had a few different construction crews and we, we used one electrical crew a lot and they, they came in and, and I, they, that, that uh, first day that I, I saw them in there they uh, had three workers and two of them were your typical construction looking guys you know they were um, Slim fit for the most part, you know, uh, maybe not clean shaven, um, you know, a little younger, but maybe younger, middle aged, that kind of thing. And, and uh, but there was one person who was with them who really didn't look like a construction worker. And uh, I looked over there, over to the side, was this young girl, about 18 or 19 years old, blonde hair, probably about five feet one, 100 pounds, you know, and. Uh, I just kind of did the other thing. I was like, is she working for you guys? And they were like, yeah, you know, she is. And, you know, I'm not a stereotype. Hey, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. You know? But it's just unusual, you know. And uh, she was in a construction site, you know. And so uh, I didn't know for sure she was, but I walked over and I talked to her. I said, well, I, you know, I want to know, why did you pick this? Why are you? And she was in an apprenticeship program to become an electrician. No, she just didn't look like an electrician. You know, I mean, it's just, you know, everybody's got their stereotypes, I guess, for different things. But, you know, she, she just didn't fit the bill, you know. She looked out of place, you know. But, uh, and, and for some reason, a lot of people, when they look, look at Jesus as a man, they think he's out of place to be God. You know, he, he, as a man, maybe he didn't really fit the bill. You know what most people think God should look like. You know that, that's kind of what I'm getting at. And you know they, they don't see God becoming a man, so it makes it hard for them to believe. And uh, you know, there's, there's some of you here this morning. I'm sure that you, you've had doubts about the sufficiency of Christ. You know, you wonder is Jesus who He said He was. And we've talked about some of that just recently. You know about the claims of Christ and and. And, uh, and I'm, like, I'm not, I'm not going to re-preach that. Y'all, we can talk about that later. But, but have you believed that Jesus has God become a man? Today, I want you to understand a few reasons that Jesus is greater than everything, even in his humanity. To help you to understand that even as a man, Jesus is still God. 
He's still greater than everything. Okay, number one, we're going to look at this. As a man, this is one of the reasons that, that Jesus is greater than everything. Even as a man, as a man, Jesus recaptured man's lost domain. So you're going to have to stick with me. Nobody fall asleep this morning because uh, here's one thing about Hebrews. Hebrews is, is pretty, pretty complicated. And uh, you know, we've looked at some complicated stuff, and we can't really get into everything that's in this text. I just want to try to give you an overview and help you understand. But, but uh, just, just follow along. Because here when you look in these verses, in verses 5, 6, and 7, what we see is a quote from Psalm 8, really. And you know, he says, uh, this has been testified somewhere in verse 6. And you, if you look at Psalm 8, verses 4 through 6, it says, this is a psalm of David, King David. And he says, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet. And we see this theme throughout Scripture a few different places. But, but think about this. As a man, Jesus recaptured man's lost dominion. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and you read the Word of God, and you see when God created Adam and Eve and He put them into the Garden of Eden, they, they were perfect creatures. They, they had no sin. And, and God gave them a dominion over all of creation. You know, and Adam named the animals and all this. And, and uh, you know, everything was pretty much under His command. Now, everything in the world that was created was subject to Him as a man. And so that, that's how it began. And in the psalm we read here in Psalms 8, you know, King David, he marveled. You know, he's thinking about all this. And he's marveling that God would entrust all of his power and glory and all of his dominion with the things as feeble as a man. You know, I mean, that, that it almost sounds crazy, doesn't it? But, you know, he talks about how man was created a little lower than the angels. Nobody here is going to get into a sword fight with an angel and live. I mean, they're, they're, be they're better than us, aren't they? In that sense, they're, they're stronger, they're faster, they can fly, you know, they're, they're timeless, they're eternal creatures, and all this stuff. And so it does sound a little bit crazy because man's inferior to angels, but God gave man special privileges that the angels don't have. And He gave him dominion over creation. In verse 5 it says it wasn't to the angels that God subjected the world to come. And so he, he's reminding us, look, it wasn't the angels that God gave uh, you know, dominion over the world. He's talking about the world to come. And so that brings us to, to what's going to happen. And you know, what Scripture teaches us that one of these days, this sinful world is going to be over. There's going to be a new world and it'll be restored. And I believe even better than it was in the day if it's possible. And Adam and Eve where they existed before sin. And so, you know, when we think about this in verse 8, he's talking about, um, well, in verse 5, you know, we think that God never promised that angels would reign, you know, in this world to come. But the writer of Hebrews notices a problem here. When you look in verse 8, he points out that in the present time, we do not see everything in subjection to man. Do you see that in verse 8? He says, now putting everything in subjection under his feet, now I'm putting everything in subjection in. He left nothing outside his grip. Look at that last line. He says, at present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. And so, you know, man does have some dominion over the world today. I mean, I mean, hopefully we are responsible for the world we live in as mankind. And look, let me put this thing right there. I'm talking about man and mankind today. I'm sorry I'm not a good gender neutral person. This includes women too, okay? I just want to make sure we qualify that. I'm just too lazy to say men and women every time. I, I, you know. But but anyway, <laughs> we're talking about mankind. And so, you know, we do mankind does have some dominion over the world. But he's definitely not in control of all creatures like Adam and Eve were. You know, I mean, think about it. Uh, you know, before the fall, man can't really control all the wild animals or the birds or the fish and, or the weather and things like that. Man, man can't even control himself, right? I mean, we can't even do that. So how are we going to control all this other stuff? So as a result of sin, and the Bible teaches because of sin and the curse of sin, our world is cursed and we're cursed. And so we lost a lot of that. Most of it, I would venture to say. And, and so... In that, we've lost a lot of the power and the glory 
that comes from that intimate relationship with God, that perfect relationship. It's not what it needs to be, and not what it could be, and it's not what it's going to be. So I'm going to talk about that. But we've lost a lot of that. And, you know, all the power and dominion of reigning over God's creation. And, you know, we see a lot of that in the desire of people. You know, God's built us in a way that even as fallen creatures, there's part of us that tries to still act out a lot of the things that God has made us. And we see this in men and in people today. You know, I think about these people who they want to conquer Mount Everest. You know, they want to climb to the top. You know, I think part of that is that domain that God gave us and that that will to rule sovereignly, in a sense, over all of His creation. They want to conquer that. you got people, they, they want to be the fastest person in the world, the fastest runner. They, they do whatever they can. They want to conquer that. You know, the people that want to dive to the deepest parts of the sea. And, and, and you know, we can go on and on and we think about um, all, all these other people who, you know, the technologies that, that they develop to, to conquer disease and and uh, travel into space. And all. You know, there's a lot of people trying to use everything that God gave them to be the best they can be in certain areas. And, and this is kind of kind of gets back to that maybe inward desire of, of what God has, has created us to do. You know? And um, you know, even even today, you know, we think about some people, they do tame lions, you know. I mean, and sometimes they attack them, you know, we see that too. And, and uh, you know they tame animals that work for entertainment, or, or you know or they use them to work with. And all that's just a glimpse of what God really intended for it to be. You know, it's just a glimpse, really. I mean, of what we, what man can do. All the greatest achievements of man, just a glimpse of what we can do when God restores everything into order as it should be. It's going to be awesome. Folks, I'm telling you, heaven. And in eternity with God is going to be out of this world. I'm telling you, you know. But anyway, but what you know, what we, what we all struggle with most is taming ourselves. Isn't that what we struggle with most? You know, think about it. You know, sin rules and reigns in our hearts, and it often ruins our lives because of our own self-seeking pleasures and our own self-seeking glory. It just destroys. Us. And God created man to rule and reign over creation, but our world is in a state of decay and self-destruction. So what can we do? You know? And so he's talking about this, and then he gets to verse 9, and, and he says, but. You see that, but? That's a big but, y'all. You know? Look at verse 9. He says, but we see him. You see that? We see him. And this is a recurring theme throughout Hebrews. The author of Hebrews keeps telling us to look away from this, whatever it is, and look to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. And, and so he's wanting us to look at Jesus and he says, even while he was made lower than the angels, he was crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that the, by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. You see, Jesus... When we look at him, we see it. He's the answer to this fallen state where we have lost dominion over creation. And the answer to that is God gave us Jesus. And God became a man in Jesus Christ. And through his suffering and his death for our sin, he did that so that this dominion could be restored for all mankind. And think about Jesus' life. We see it demonstrated in his life. All you got to do is read the Gospels. Jesus demonstrated sovereign domain over all creation. Over fish. You remember uh, uh, they were getting on to the disciples because they hadn't paid their tax. And Jesus says, Hey, Peter, go down to the sea and throw in a line. And the first fish you bring out, reach into its mouth and pull out a coin and pay your tax and pay mine. So Peter went. And guess what happened? Just like Jesus said, He's in control over that fish. And then there was that other time, you know, He was out. And, oh, we're talking about fish. And the disciples have been fishing all night. They were professional fishermen. That caught anything. They're coming in and bringing their boats in. And Jesus says, hey, have you, have you caught anything? Oh, no, we've been fishing all night. We've not caught anything. Jesus says, hey, throw your nets on the other side of the boat. And he's like, hey, why do we think of that? You know? But no, that's not what they're asking. They're thinking, he's crazy. But they throw their nets over and obey Jesus. And they pull in the catch. They can't even pull in. And you know, the nets start breaking. Jesus has power over the fish of the sea. You know, and then we think about.
well, uh, as, as a man, Jesus had dominion over wild animals. It's, maybe you can't figure this one out. But in Matthew, excuse me, Mark chapter 1, when Jesus goes out, in verses 12 and 13, he goes out immediately into the wilderness. And look at this. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, and he was tempted by Satan. And look at this last line. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Okay? And so there he was, wild animals. And hey, he, he's got control over every wild animal. Remember that you know, Jesus calmed the raging storms and seas. He cast out demons. He healed diseases. He gave sight to the blind men. I mean, you know, we could go on and on. And he demonstrated in his human body that there's nothing in creation that's not under his domain. He's in control. He demonstrated that in his life. And, uh, you know, he puts everything under his feet. The Apostle Paul reminds us in Ephesians, he says, and that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put, look at this, all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. The man was crowned with this glory and honor and, and given dominion over all creation to sin destroyed. And Jesus reclaimed it. And he defeated sin on Calvary's cross. And believers today, I believe, sharing that dominion. If you look in Revelation chapter 1, it says, just look at verse 6, and he made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And so, you know, we got to look at some of this stuff later. Look, when I was a kid, I talked to uh, my mom and dad into letting me have a pet bird. Y'all ever have a pet bird? Some of y'all, I didn't have one lady that came. She got a bunch of cockatoo, cockatoo, I wanted a parrot. Parrots are cool, right? I mean, they're big birds. I got a parakeet, you know, uh, and I was thankful for it, you know, okay? But uh, anyway. We named that, that bird Gertie. <coughs> it's hard to teach parakeets how to talk, y'all. I'll tell you that. But anyway, I talk to the bird all the time. I never could get to say anything. But anyway, but I would, you know, a lot of times it was my responsibility to clean the cage. Yeah, that's why I don't have one now. But anyway, but you know, when I clean the cage, a lot of times I just open the door and let let the bird out, let it fly around. Right First, make sure all the doors are closed and all the windows are closed. But, um, and you know, when it came time to go back in the cage, it really wasn't hard most of the time, but sometimes, man, I mean, you, you had, it was hard to get the bird to get up. It was really hard once she figured out how to open the door herself, and we had to start tying the bread you know? Because when she let herself out, that means she didn't want to go back in. You know, the only time she'd go back in is when she got hungry, you know? But we had to recapture Gertie, put her back in the cage, you know? She was out. <laughs> And, and I, I'm just telling you that because, you see, our God-given dominion over all creation was out the door with our sin. It's gone. But when Jesus came and lived as a man, He demonstrated this dominion. And when He died for our sins and arose from the grave, he recaptured that for us. And those who belong to Him can experience some of that now and will experience all of it in the future. And Jesus is greater than everything, even in His humanity, because as a man, He recaptured man's lost dominion. Another reason we can say Jesus is greater is because as a man, Jesus restored man's unity to glory. And this goes, goes hand in hand with it in a sense. But, but look at verses 10 through 13. Verse 10 reminds us that Jesus is the creator of all things. He's by whom all things exist. You see that? And the word for founder here in the ESV, and in some translations it says captain of our salvation, it literally can be translated pioneer. You know, it's, it's a word that means the, the first one who opens up a way for others. You know, that, that's what we're talking about. And so when, when the Son of God became a man, He gave up all the glories of being God. Philippians 2 talks about that. He, you know, he left 
He didn't quit being God, but he left up the throne room. He left the throne room. He left the glories and the benefits of being God by, by becoming a man. He limited himself for a time. And this is what the text says. And when he defeated sin and death and ascended back to heaven as the resurrected Christ, he regained all that glory. You know, and now he shares that glory with everyone who believes in him and trusts him for salvation. That's that's good news that he's sharing that with us. And it says here in our text that he's bringing many sons and daughters right, to glory. He's bringing us with him. He's bringing us into that glory. Verse 12 is a quote from Psalm 22, 22. And um, in, in that we say, you know, Christ is united to us. And we're, we're united to him. The reference to his own brothers and sisters unites us to Christ as a part of the same family. We're part of the family of God. That's a, that's a song, right? And, and we, we emphasize that a lot here, being a part of the family of faith. And listen, if we are of the same family, we're of the same nature. You see, through the sanctifying work of Christ, those of us who believe and, and accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, we, we become the children of God. And we're given a new nature, not unlike His own nature. And when the Holy Spirit comes in us, we're given a nature like Christ, a nature to not sin. You know, when we're born, we're born with a nature to sin. And we have that propensity. But when we give our hearts and lives to Christ, a new nature overtakes us. And that comes from being a part of the glory of God in the family of God because of the indwelling Christ. You know, the Holy Spirit of God. And so we become one with Him. We're united in His glory as a part of the family of God. And so He restored that for us. Now Adam and Eve had that in the garden. And it, felt, it don't take long today to look and see. And most people do not demonstrate the glory of God in their lives, right? But Jesus came to restore that. When I was 15 years old, I bought a 1965 Ford Mustang. Yep. You know, hey, I'd seen the one an older friend had, and I just fell in love with it. And I'd always liked the, the Cobra, Cobras, you know, that were out around a few years earlier. And uh, I, I just I just loved them. And so I, I, I wanted one, and they were old. I could afford one. You know, I worked. And at 15, I got enough money pretty much to buy one. I bought one. And uh, I still got it, you know. I mean, yeah, y'all ain't seen me drive it, but, uh, but you know, uh, Anyway, around 1995, what happened was I drove it spread. But around 1995, a dog ran out in front of me, you know, crunched the front right toward the panel, and then I parked it, started working on it, and then we went to Bible college and school, so we parked it and sit there ever since, you know? But, I tell you what, I've got plans. <laughs> it's still mine. No man knows the day or the hour. Right? That thing's going to be restored to its former glory. All right? I'm good. I, I, I really want to do that. But, but listen, it cannot do that on its own. It needs me. And because of sin, you know, we were separated from God and we were without hope in ourselves. We needed God to do something for us. And if the Son of God had not become a man, we could have never been restored to the unity that comes from being a part of the family of God. We would have never known that if Jesus had never become a man. So thank God that Jesus became a man. It didn't make Him less than God. To me, it made Him greater than we can ever imagine. That He would love us enough to do that for us. When Jesus did become a man, and He did become the pioneer of our salvation. That was completed through His suffering. Friends, that makes Jesus greater than everything. Even in His humanity. Another reason is this. As a man, Jesus released man's suffering bondage. We look at verses 14 through 16 here. He's talking about flesh and blood. He's comparing us to angels. You know, and angels cannot die. You know, but they, they can't die. And, and we know Jesus didn't come to save the angels, right? He, he didn't come to save them. They, they didn't need, need saving. Or, you know, or, well, 
know, there are fallen angels. But he didn't come to save angels. He came to save you and me. He, it talks about here the sons of Abraham. You know, Jesus had to take on flesh and blood and become a man. And through his own sacrifice and his suffering, he defeated death and he destroyed Satan. And by destroying we don't mean annihilate. It means he pretty much incapacitated. All of his word is a bill of fact. God's going to get done what he wants to get done. And ain't nothing Satan can do about it. You know, and ain't, and death, it, can make, it makes no effect of, uh, 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 to anybody who belongs to the Lord. The text says the devil has power over death. We know that God only is the one who controls life and death, right? So what it means is that Satan is the one who brought death into the world through, through sin. And so, you know, that he's the author of sin. And we know the wages of sin is death. And so he's the one who ultimately brought it in. And, and he uses death and fear as a weapon against people to try to manipulate them and to gain control over them. And, and you know, and so, but listen, for those of us who believe and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, we've been delivered from Satan's authority over death and over this fear. We don't have to fear death. How many of you know that? We don't have to fear death as children of God. There's nothing to fear. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus gave us victory over death. Everyone who believes in Him, we've been given eternal life, and there's nothing left to fear. One time a little boy, I may have told you all this story, but it's still pretty cool. It's a fit, so if you've heard it, hey, remember it better next time, all right? But, but one time there was this little boy, and uh, he was riding in the car with his dad, and... Um, as they were going along, a honeybee flew in the window. Started buzzing around the little boy's head, and he, he went ecstatic. You know, he's crying. And some of y'all have witnessed this, right? Some of y'all have been a participant. You know what it's like. You know, and he's just going crazy about, about this thing. And it wasn't unwarranted because he's allergic to these things, you know, and so it's very serious. And so his father, you know, as he's, as he's trying to get, get the car over the side, he's trying to shoo the bee out the window and this and that. And can't quite reach it, and all of a sudden it flies by. He just reaches up and catches it in his hand. And after a few seconds pass, he opens his hand, and when he does, the bee flies out. He goes right back, it's right over near the boy. The boy's screaming, Ah, oh, daddy, daddy, daddy! You know, and the dad says, Son, you don't have anything to be afraid of. I've got this thing. He showed him in his hand the sting, where the bee had stung him inside his hand. So, for those of you who don't know, it means it can not sting him, it can sting anyone else. And so, this Jesus didn't become an angel to redeem the fallen angels. He stooped even lower and became a man and a servant of men so that he could save you and me. And he took the sting of death and all fear of it for us so that we had nothing. And so, today, if you will believe in Him and accept this gift of grace, you can be brought by His Spirit and empowered to have victory over the sin that enslaves you now. Because we're talking about how Jesus releases us from this slavery of sin. And you can have victory over death forever, you know? And so Jesus is greater than everything in His humanity. Let's do a little refresher. And we'll get to our last point real quick. Because Jesus recaptured man's lost dominion. He restored man's unity to glory. And He released man's suffering to bondage. And now, one more thing. As a man, Jesus represents a sinful people. And this makes Him greater. You know? Think about this. We look at verses 17 and 18. You know, angels are pure spirits who've never suffered, and they cannot identify, really, with us. In our weaknesses and our needs, they have no idea of what it's like. But when God became a man, the person of Jesus Christ, He was made like us in every way, the text says, and He experienced life just like we experience life, with a human nature, just like ours. You know, and so Jesus knows what it's like be a helpless baby. Yeah. He knows what it's like to be a vulnerable child. He knows what it's like to be a crazy adolescent. Yeah. He knows what it's like to experience hunger and thirst. He knows what it's like to be tired 
you know, and, and he understands what it's like to be despised and rejected. He knows what it's like to be alone. He knows what it's like to be falsely accused and lied to and lied about. He knows. And Jesus knows what it's like to bear the weight of sin and suffering. You know, he knows what it's like. He bore yours and mine. You know, he, he knows. He was not a sinner, but he bore ours. <coughs> he understands the wrath of God. He knows what it's like to die. You know? All this was part of his preparation to serve as the great high priest of heaven. And he did all that so he could sympathize, or yet empathize with our struggle. And our weaknesses and our life. And Jesus is merciful and He's faithful. And He shows His mercy to us. And He, he can never fail in His priestly duties. He always hears. He always understands. And He always uh, helps us to be reconciled to God. And he needed no sacrifice for Himself because He was sinless. He became a sacrifice for us. And so all His work now as a great high priest connects us and keeps us connected with the Heavenly Father. You know? And that's, that's who He is. And that, that makes Him great. He had to be a man to do that. You know? And it makes sense when you really look at Scripture and you see how God works. Things out. It makes sense. And, you know, and so He represents us as a sinful people. Because He understands what it's like to be tempted to live in a world like we live in. And when I was a kid, I grew growing up on a farm, I remember walking through the barnyard. And when you walk through the barnyard, it'd be pretty tricky. You know, some of y'all know that. But uh, and there's some solid spots that look solid, and there's some that are look solid that are not solid. You know, and uh, you know, depending on where you put your foot, you can either land pretty solid on solid ground, or you can just sink for inches. You know, I've lost some shoes. I'm just telling you. Uh, uh, but uh, when I was out there with my dad, I can remember, you know, and he taught me this. He would go in front, and wherever he stepped, that's where I got stepped. If he sunk, I'd find me another place. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and so, but Jesus, he, 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 he never sank. And, and, and we need to try to step three steps, and that's what he does for us, you know. He, he did that for us. He went before us, and he did it perfectly, so we could walk in his steps. Live and love and like Jesus. Amen. Because of that, He represents us before God as a great high priest. And when those of us who are tempted to sin, He stands ready to help us and He stands ready to deliver us. And He knows what it is to be tempted and He knows what it is to, to uh, overcome every temptation because that's what He did. And He has the ability to help us overcome every temptation that we face. The word here in verse 18 uh, there's a word there that's often translated secure. I think it's translated help in the ESV. I don't have it right in front of it. Angels can help us, you know. But that word for secure, it means to uh, run to the cry of the child to help. That's what the word means. Secure. And that's what Jesus is for us. Think about that. He can do that. If when we cry for help, that's what He does. He runs. He can do that. Angels can't do that. Jesus can do that. Because He's been where we are. And so, this morning, what I want you to understand is Jesus, great Lord, is a man. And he, maybe you don't, you don't think of Him as God and having this ability to do all this stuff. And be so great, he really is. When I, when I was a, a youth pastor at East the Father Baptist Church, we had a basketball goal outside. And uh, we put it up, and on Sunday afternoons, and I, I spent Mondays down there, uh, I would often play basketball with kids in the community. And, and uh, that was back when I, seriously, I don't you know, 70 pounds a lot, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, so. That'll help you with what I'm about to say. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we, we had a, a basketball game. It was about nine and a half to maybe nine, eight, nine, ten, something like that. And uh, I could just about know it on that. You know, I mean, my problem really was holding the ball, you know, getting it up there. But, you know, I could dunk. So 
small balls on it. You know, I thought that was the stuff, you know, I'm not that tall. But anyway, one of the kids brought a cousin with him one day, and he's come down. He's, I'm kidding you, I'm saying he was five, six, and that's generous, okay? Uh, and we started playing, and you know, I went up, you know, kind of done or something, and messing around. Here, this kid gets a ball. He takes three dribbles, goes up, boom, goes down like Michael Jordan. <laughs> and I was like, good lord. And I walked over, and I'm like, wait a minute. I just looked up, and man, I thought, you know, what's he got in his shoe? You know? <laughs> He had links. I'm telling you. He did it over and over. I just left. <laughs> <laughs> but here's my point. We're going to wrap up. I know it's getting late. We need to get started a little bit late, so I'll use that excuse. He didn't look like somebody could go. I mean, he didn't. Ain't no way. I mean, he was spud webbish, you know. I mean, he was, he was tiny. But man, he didn't even look close, you know. And here's the thing, for some, Jesus at first glance may not look like God. He may not even look close to some of it, but let me assure you, Jesus is greater. He's greater than anything your mind can conceive. He's greater than anything in this world. He's greater than anything out of this world. Even though he was a man, he's still greater. He's still greater. And uh, he became a man. And he did all this stuff that we talked about this morning. So he represents us. And I want to ask you this morning, does he represent you? Will you experience this dominion as God has created it and intended it? Will you be a part of that because of your faith in Jesus? Are you a part of this unity of the family of God that we talked about because of Jesus? Are you a child of God? Have you been released? from the prison of sin and the bondage that it has over you because of Jesus and all its consequences? Does Jesus represent you today? If not, why? He loves you. He did all this to restore you to the right place to you. And right now, that all can be yours. So we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. Let's bow our heads and let's have a moment of response. Father, we come before you right now. Lord, we thank you for loving us. Lord, we thank you today that we don't depend on just a man to redeem us from our sins, but we depend on the man, the God man, Jesus Christ, the only one who could do the things he did to make things right with you. And so, Lord, right now, we pray that you would speak to every heart. If there's any here who knows a thing, or who's got the gift of the Spirit of God in their heart and life, who doesn't fear that, who, who's uh, striving for dominion, who loves to try to live like, live, love like Jesus. For those who think they don't, don't have that, we pray right now that they would come to you. If you're here this morning, the Bible says that if you call out to Jesus, you say, Dear Lord, uh, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that He died on the cross for my sins. I believe that He rose again the third day like the Bible teaches. The Bible says if you believe those things and confess your sins to God, you say, Dear Lord, I realize I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. And you invite Him into your heart and life. You say, Lord, come into my heart and life and dwell me and fill me. Give me this power over temptation. God, give me purpose and meaning in life. You'll do that. The Bible says that He will come and you can experience that. So if you'll pray that prayer right now, the Bible says, Whosoever calls in the name of the Lord, we stand. So right now, let's do that. Lord, we give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. So right now,